Oh, hello, everyone. This is Holger Marsha speaking. I am the head of the chair of, of the group uh, Computational Multiphase Flow at Technical University Darmstadt in Germany. And this is the session Particle Droplets in Bubbles 2 at the end of the day here in, in Europe. And um, I'm going to introduce the first talk, which is about bubble plume application in water oxygenation using developed MPPIC foam. So Farsad, please. Now you can share the screen and the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Farzad Faraji Dizaji, and I am a postdoc at Dublin City University. And my research is about the bubble plume application in water oxygenation using developed MPPI siphon. And you can see the names of some other, um, other colleagues here. I have listed all of the affiliations here. Yeah. Uh, let's do a project overview. We have a, in DCU, we have a dedicated research tool. We are developing a dedicated research tool for which we are going to use that one for the wastewater treatment and and activated sludge. And this tool enables us to use a variety of pumps, aerators, and mixers to do the research on the wastewater treatment, and which help us to, do, uh, to find out some innovation in aeration process. For this one, also, we have developed a, a research tool. We have a developed a, a, a open form code, which this code enable, enable us uh, for the medium range, uh, uh, to test the medium range scale installation up to 40 meter cube to 100 meter cube volumes. Also, it, this uh, code uh, is, has a very accurate prediction of the SOTE, standard oxygen transfer efficiency, and it is suitable for the mechanical aerators. Uh, in this one, uh, I'm going to play the video. Uh, you can see in the left hand side and a self aspirating aerator and in the right hand side, you can see the simulation of this uh, self aspirating aerator. As you see, the bubbles comes out of the from the jets and a mixer starts to mix it. Uh, this one, uh, we have we are dealing with a, with a complex phenomena here. The bubble high velocity jets uh, interact with the bubble. We have bubble breakup, bubble uh, uh, merging. Also, we have a high flow rate of air, injected air, and we have a, in some places we have a locally high, uh, high, locally high volume rate, volume of the oxygen, volume of air inside the cell, which is a, is a, is a challenging. So instead of this, we are doing a simple test in one meter depth uh, uh, tank which we are enabled to, to study the bubble plume oxygenation, which we can study the efficiency of the, uh, the, the micro bubbles and study the dead zones in the, that uh, one meter tank. As you can see here, uh, it's our, um, we have two tests. I already explained the large test facility. And this is our small test facility, which is just one meter. We have two different methods uh, to characterize the bubble distribution, bubble size distribution. As you can see here, here, we have done both shadow sizing and optical probe to find out the size distribution of the bubbles in our experiment. And uh, let's look into the code. Um, uh, as you, uh, I think all of you are familiar with the classical discrete element method, DM method, Ulerian Lagrangian, but uh, MPPIC form is a little different. We have, we deduct the portion of the volume fraction that, of that up particles up uh, occupied from the continuous phase. So the continuity equation has been updated, has been modified. Also the momentum equation has been modified. Also we have a, a FC here, which it is the interface momentum transfer. This interface momentum transfer uh, randomize some particle velocity whilst leaving other particles unchanged. So in the packed areas, it modifies the, uh, the velocity of the bubbles or particles and leaves some of them unchanged. 
Uh, in here, uh, we have the uh, we have added to the MPPSC the oxygen transfer model for doing this. Since we are doing the finite uh, bubble, finite bubble, it is a it has a finite amount of oxygen and nitrogen inside it. So we have to do both. We have to have the oxygen mass transfer and nitrogen mass transfer. These are in the Eulerian phase. And this, the, the, the below one, the mass transfer from a single bubble, Lagrangian phase, you see the, the mass transfer from the inside a single bubble, and we extract the single bubbles and accumulate all of them and transfer this uh, accumulation of the uh, oxygen and nitrogen to the source terms here inside the Eulerian phase. And here, uh, you see the schematic figure of the oxygen transfer from a single bubble, CS and CB. The oxygen transfer velocity has been, uh, has been correlated with this equation you can see here. Also, we have used the bounce and theory uh, and temperature dependent and theory, both of them, uh, to calculate dissolved oxygen concentration. And if you send, see here that the bubble uh, pressure is bubble pressure is the atmospheric pressure plus the high, uh, plus the hydrostatic pressure and also the the surface tension pressure uh, uh, here um, we have to modify the 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 drag coefficient since it's for the bubbles so for the bubbles as you see here in the, this picture in this figure we have a wide range of the shapes of the bubble. We have in some regime, we have spherical bubbles here in the left hand side. And at the top, we have the spherical cap. So we need to uh, modify the drag coefficient. So we have these three uh, in non dimensional numbers particle Reynolds number, and Ibotos number, and Morton number. Based on this and from the literature, we have this uh, drag coefficient, which uh, enable us to consider the wide range of the drag uh, from the spherical to the spherical cap. So we have modified the drag coefficient and we, have, we are using right now this coefficient here. Uh, also, uh, we have tested our model based on the, the new drag and the, also the mass transfer. We have done a single one bubble test, which has a 500 micron and we just let it rise, and we have calculated the analytically the mass loss from that single bubble and versus computation, and the initial mass uh, content, oxygen content inside the bubble. As you see here, uh, the, the, here, the mass loss of analytical is something four times more than the initial mass, because the analytical assumes that it is a, uh, it is a infinite source of oxygen, but competition, uh, it is a finite source of oxygen. And in the initial times, both of them are the same initial times. But uh, also, when we do the competition with infinite source of oxygen, the analytical and competition match each other very well. And as you see here, the trace of the oxygen inside here, as the bubble rise up, the trace of the oxygen here uh, becomes lower and lower. But at the initial, it has, since it, is a, it has a high concentration of oxygen, we have these red regions here. We have repeated the test uh, just to uh, repeat the test with some more bubbles. As you see here in the left hand side, we have the uh, uh, let 80 bubble simulation with 20 parcels, which have or each of them has four um, uh, particles. We let them rise, and you can see here that also the traces in the right hand side, and it is almost 80 since it is. So the first one is a single bubble test and it's an 80 bubble simulation. The result is almost very close to the result of the 80 single bubble test. Then here, uh, we have uh, we need some input data for our um, uh, simulation. We have this uh, 2.65 normal liter A per minute, we, uh, normal liter A per minute, which we change it to the, the, the kilogram per second. Also, we have, we need a distributed, distributed size cloud. As you see here, we have some data from the shadow sizing here. We have the normal distribution, uh, this uh, gray line, 
the Vichy mean is 1.2 millimeter. We have normal diffusion mean equal to two. The blended distribution, which is equal to one, the blended distribution one and blended distribution two. We have tested all these bubble size distribution. Also in the right hand side, we have single size cloud, which all of the bubbles at the initial, uh, at the release, at the injection, have 200 micron, 300, 400, 500, 1000, and 1500 micron. Uh, here it's a sample of the, our simulation. As you see here, in the left hand side, it's the, uh, the water velocity magnitude as the bubble rise, rises. And the right hand side, we have the, uh, the oxygen, oxygen, dissolved oxygen in the, in the water. As you see, as time passes, the dissolved oxygen becomes more and more inside the domain. Uh, as the mass transfer from the oxygen from inside the bubbles to the domain here in the right hand side. Um, okay. And uh, our results, we have some probes to calculate the, to find out what is the, the dissolved oxygen. As you see in the top one, we have the results for the shadow sizing and all of the our other size distribution. And as we see here, our results is very sensitive to the size distribution of the bubbles here in the dissolved oxygen in the top picture, top figure. And in the below one, we have the, the, the minus Ln1 minus C over the C saturated. And we, as you see here, the results is linear. So we understand the dissolved oxygen process is exponential. And these are the KLA, which is the slope of this uh, lines here, it is calculated in the right hand side. And as you see, it is completely different for different size, bubble size distribution. For a better understanding, we have to repeat the same thing for the single size cloud. So 500 micron, 1000 micron, and 1500 micron. And as you see, as the bubble size increases, as the bubble size increases, the KLA becomes lower and lower. And maybe the KLA becomes lower and lower. It means that the efficiency of the, the, the efficiency of the mass transit becomes lower and lower. And uh, yeah, uh, and these are the some uh, results of the, our, uh, some key points of our model. We have a validated drag model and oxygenation model for the single bubble. Also, we have added the momentum source and external rotor added to the code to simulate the rotor effect of the rotor on the, the air when we are the, when we want to mix the bubbles. Also, we, I understand that the below the 500 micron, the efficiency of, of bubbles is almost 100% in one meter uh, tank height, and it is uh, the dissolved oxygen and KLA is highly sensitive to the bubble size distribution. And uh, just one, we want to thank to the Enterprise Island for funding this project. Thank you very much. So thank you for the very nice and clear presentation. We have a couple of questions uh, in, in the panel. So uh, one is coming from Richard Kenny, and he is asking uh, if the surface tension effects are included in your model. Yes, it is included, yeah, in our model, yeah. Uh, it is included and surface tension affects the, the pressure of the bubble and pressure of the bubble affects the dissolved oxygen in the model. Uh, yes, I show it here. So, uh, here exactly. Yeah. The bubble pressure is here and we use the bubble pressure here in the Bunsen theory to calculate the, the, the dissolved oxygen using the Henry count, Henry theory. So yes, it affects the everything, yeah, the surface tension. But it is low, it is maybe 3%, 4% effect. Mm -hmm. We have another question, Anonymous. Uh, which time steps are you using? Uh, the time step, actually, uh, I am using the max co equal to half. So the time step varies, but it is maybe, 0 0.01 right now for this simulation, 0 0.01 for this simulation, yeah. Okay, great. 
another one coming in from Axel Dorian Pipil Toko. Uh, which influence is the most significant surface tension or interfacial tension? Now I, uh, I have asked what the difference is, but maybe you, you can find it. <laughs> uh, actually, I don't understand the question completely, but uh, the thing is that the atmospheric pressure has the highest in one meter tank. It is the atmospheric pressure is, is one atmosphere. The hydrostatic pressure is almost 10% of the atmospheric pressure. And this one is just 3%. The, the surface is just almost 3% of the, the atmospheric pressure. So the most significant is hydrostatic pressure. Surface tension is also just important in very small bubbles, not in large bubbles, but we include it in all of them. Yeah. Maybe I can ask a final question, then we have to move on. Um, so you, on this slide that you currently show, you show the mass transfer for oxygen and nitrogen being taken into account. Yeah. Does this mean you take into account conjugate mass transfer, meaning that the bubble fills up with nitrogen as the oxygen leaves the bubble? Yes, exactly. It can, for example, a bubble can transfer the oxygen outside and it can take the infinite nitrogen inside. Also, it can, in a, based on the situation, it can, uh, it can both of the oxygen and nitrogen go outside. And if the bubble content, mass content, becomes uh, from a critical, lower than critical point, we can vanish, we can delete the particle. Yeah, it is a, just a two-way uh, coupling in this one. Very nice work. So we have a, a couple of more questions maybe in, in, the, in the panel, so you might want to answer them uh, after, after the talk, right? Okay, okay. Um, thank so you let's, very much. let's move on. Thank you. Okay, I stop sharing. So, yeah. So let's move on uh, to the next talk, which will be given by Sergei Lesnik with the title Influence of Bubble Size Distribution on Acoustically Cavitation Flows, please. Yeah, thank you, Holger. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, my talk today is about acoustic cavitation, and uh, it's a special field uh, in physics uh, and fluid dynamics as well. Um, so that's why I uh, keep it short on the uh, equations and uh, introduce just uh, the model and our results. Hopefully it will be understandable. So, uh, first of all, let me show you what is acoustic cavitation actually about. And um, um, cavitation is about evaporation of the liquid in the liquid uh, by lowering the pressure. So, if you uh, are below the evaporation pressure, the liquid will evaporate. And uh, you might be familiar with hydrodynamic cavitation happening at ship's propellers, um, which is the mechanical cause for the acoustic cavitation. The cause is the sound source. And we have here in this animation, sound source immersed into the liquid from above. And the sound waves, which are emitted downwards, uh, they cause uh, the local pressure to be low enough to for the liquid to evaporate and the cavitation bubbles form. So that's how how it works. Um, and uh, it's a multi-scale problem because if we zoom in into these uh, conical structures under underneath this sound source, we may see another structures and which consist of single oscillating bubbles. And as you can see here, it's a uh, micrometer range. Uh, on, on the left, the largest scale is centimeter. And from temporal point of view, it's also uh, these oscillations ha happening in micrometer scales. So multi-scale. How do we decouple this? We introduce uh, a Helmholtz equation, which is a wave equation frequency domain. We also solve 1D model for the radial bubble dynamics. So we do not discretize the bubble, it's just some uh, ODEs. Um, but the bubble motion is solved uh, with the Lagrangian particles in open form, which I explain in a bit. Yeah, and we have to, to couple all of these models. So uh, for the, how does the oscillation of a bubble look like? You can see it here from video from the experiment synchronized with the 
bubble radius. Yeah, here is the time um, going on. And uh, here, for example, expression uh, expansion wave is coming. And now a compression wave is uh, coming and the bubble collapses. This violent collapse may cause temperatures up to 10,000 kelvins, um, which means that uh, a lot of energy is dissipated and this is this damps the acoustic field. So that's an important connection. This bubble actually introduces a great damping. And also acoustic pressure uh, has some forcing on this bubble. So they let the bubbles move and uh, uh, these bubbles move also the liquid. Um, how do we put everything together? So uh, the bubble oscillation this is what it is. It's a pre-processing step, right? We saw them, them before in Python. Uh, then we need some integrals out of them, which we put into the tables. And the use, we use this one by in open form, right? In open form, we solve uh, the mentioned Helmholtz equation, yeah, yeah, this wave equation. Uh, we have acoustic pressure. With this acoustic pressure, we go into the tables, get the damping coefficients, and then apply them again uh, in the Helmholtz equation. Similar things happening with the forcing. Uh, momentum transfer happens between the uh, the bubbles, uh, which are Lagrangian particles, and with the liquid, which is Eulerian. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, the bubbles move the liquid actually. So some implementation had to be done here. Yeah, the Python part. Um, the most difficult part was this one in open form because the Helmholtz equation uh, doesn't like iterative solvers. We had to introduce a direct linear solver. And also for the coupling, this acoustic coupling, it's uh, highly nonlinear. We had to use a Newton-Raphson solver to couple it. Yeah, uh, this acoustic force computation was also a bit involved. Uh, let's see the results. Here I have cylindrical tank with a 12 centimeter sonotrode. Uh, and uh, it's similar to the one I, I showed in the video at the beginning. But here we can just take a wedge because it's axisymmetric, right? And um, here we have a void fraction on the left hand side and uh, a velocity magnitude on the right hand side. And as you can see here, a uh, jet develops. So we have this conical structure uh, as in the experiment, also the jet flowing. Uh, the bubbles populating here in the domain. Uh, some Something interesting happens here. We, we see some clustering and uh, also some, some flow fluctuation. We couldn't explain this flow fluctuation because of some uh, flow instability. So we had to look at the, uh, at the, at the acoustic pressure here. Um, and uh, these are the easy lines of the acoustic pressure. And as you can see here, it's actually smooth. Yeah, maxima going to minima. But in this region, uh, with these fluctuations form, we have some maxima and minima interchanging. Uh, this leads uh, and yeah, bubbles are driven by the, by the gradient of acoustic pressure. So this leads uh, to some clustering of the bubbles, right? And these clusters, they of course um, has have an influence on the momentum exchange, which why this the flow is fluctuating. So then we did some studies, and one study of this is a bubble size distribution study. In this legend, you can see what experiments we run. Uh, there are three monodispersed cases, so just one bubble size is chosen. And uh, there are some size distributions from the experiments. And uh, here, uh, yeah, they're presented here. It's, it was measured by our partners. Um, so important result for the pressure, right? Uh, you can see it's a uh, it's, uh, pressure along this line here, just underneath the sonotrode. Um, the monodispersed case with two micrometers bub bubbles has the highest pressure. So that has to do with the with the bubble 
because um, the smallest bubbles are the most stable one and they uh, start to oscillate at the higher pressures, right? That's the reasoning. Then what happens with the velocity? I wouldn't expect, expect it. Uh, I would expect that the velocity yeah, for two micrometers would be different from all others. But what we see, the monitor space cases have the highest velocities and the distribution cases have the lower velocity. What actually happens is that uh, the larger bubbles from this jet distribu from these distributions they damp the, the acoustic field, right? But the momentum which comes, uh, yeah, most of the bubbles are the small one, also for the distri this distri size distributions. Um, they do not uh, uh, transfer so much momentum because the, the pressure is low. That's interesting result. Um, you have to simulate it to to know exactly. And the uh, 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 last study is about the um, uh, void fraction. So void fraction or bubble density, if you want, um, bubble number in the domain. I would expect again that the uh, greatest void fraction, so a lot of bubbles will damp everything and the flow velocity would be low. It's vice versa. Actually, for the for the highest void fraction, the velocity is the highest because the damping is not as high. You know, you see, it's it's a little bit, little bit different, but there is no much change between between the cases, right? Uh, what happens is actually there are so many bubbles; they uh, see some acoustic pressure and they they move on and um, they scale, uh, they bring a lot of momentum into because it's a lot of them. That's that's what actually happens. And here uh, is 3D, some 3D simulation. I just put it's one recent result. It's a different setup. Um, yeah, but the jet how it looks uh, in 3D, right? So um, to summarize it up, um, yeah, now we we are capable of computing cavitation flows comparable to, to the experiments. We explained why fluctuations appear. We uh, showed that the real size distribution is pretty important, that the high void fraction leads to high velocities. And uh, I have to remark that, uh, of course, real bubbles are a little bit different because they may coalesce and they may dissolve into the liquid. Uh, that's why we need, we actually, for further de future development, we need four way coupling and maybe some scalar transport for the dissolved gas. So, thanks to DFG AF, our sponsors, also a shout out to Henry Kruscher from Wiki. Um, for his support. And if you want to check out uh, Direct Solver, I implemented for the Helmholtz equation, you can go to this site. Thank you very much. We have to thank for this very nice uh, talk. So we have, we have actually two questions, uh, more probably to come. The first one is uh, by Silvio Schmalfus. Uh, he asks uh, if you have tried out the uh, open form built in ODE solvers for solving the stiff ODE system. Um, yeah, we tried this and uh, it, it did work uh, poorly, unfortunately. Um, the, the most sophisticated solver we found is uh, BDF uh, from uh, what was the name? El Soda Solders, I think. It's actually implemented in Fortran and it's robbed by Python. And that's worked the best for us. All the, all the solvers in open form couldn't handle it, unfortunately. At least in form extent version. I don't know about the others. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for the nice presentation. So obviously well received. My question would be how much time does it take to pre-process using Python for this ODE system? Um, not, not as much. Um, it, it depends on the size distribution. If we, if we take some size distribution, I would say it's around half an hour. 
and uh, you may scale it because these ODEs are for for some pressures. So it's table of pressures, right? And uh, um, for the pressures, they are independent. So you may parallelize them on the cluster. Oh, we, have, we, have, we have one more relevant question that is coming in from Richard mm -hmm. Kenny. He's asking when the bubbles collapse, uh, they can emit chats which interact with neighbors. Is anything like this observed in your case? Um, no, uh, so it's uh, that's true what happens, but it's very microscopic um, uh, phenomena, and we we focus on only macroscopic phenomena, right? So uh, we assume the bubbles stay spheric uh, at in all all cases in all positions. Uh, we know it's not always the true at the at the sonotrot at the sound source, uh, yeah. But the, we try to approximate it as best as we can. Okay, many thanks. So with this, we come to the next speaker. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, which is Silvio Schmalfus, and he will be talking about modeling of droplet formation and growth in the turbulent moist air wind tunnel lessis D. Please, the floor is yours. You are still muted, Silvio. Okay, no? No, no, it's okay. Okay, okay. thanks again for the introduction and welcome to my talk about the modeling of public formation growth in turbulent moist air wind tunnel lasers D. I'm working at the Leibniz Institute for Tropospheric Research in Leipzig, Germany. And uh, I'll start with an introduction and I'll talk about the numerical model and the experimental setups. Afterwards, um, I show some results for a continuous and dispersed phase, and I'll end with conclusions and output. I did first uh, in, uh, short introduction about the clouds. As you all may know, they play a huge role in long term climate predictions as well as in short term weather forecasts. Um, but unfortunately, the uncertainties in cloud modeling are quite uh, huge, and this in turn leads to uncertainties in climate and weather predictions. For example, you can see here an article from German magazine Der Spiegel, the title, Why Clouds Are the Curse to All Climate Researchers. And for our investigations, it's um, necessary to know that usually in our regions, um, clouds are formed by water vapor, which condenses on so-called cloud condensation nuclei or CCNs. Um, unfortunately, these clouds are complicated to investigate. This might be uh, the reason why they are so more or less poorly understood uh, up to now. Um, one main reason for this is that they are hard to reach. You know, they are up there in the sky. Um, so you have to use airborne measurement or remote sensing or similar stuff. And um, furthermore, they are transient, they are turbulent, intermittent and in inhomogeneous, which makes it even more complicated. And last but not least, they cover a huge range of spatial and temporal scales, as you can see in the picture here at the right hand side, starting at microphysical scales where a single particle uh, microphysical uh, phenomena happens um, around, uh, it's on the nanometer micrometer scale up to the global scale where we have weather and climate phenomena. Um, for this reason, there have been simulation chambers around for quite a time now. And usually they are used for investigating cloud microphysical processes under reproducible conditions. So that makes it a little bit easier. So they're mainly focusing on the um, on the scales in this red square uh, uh, rectangle you can see there. Our focus is now on the influence of turbulence on the cloud microphysics and their interaction with the uh, um, aerosol. For this, we have laser T. This is the turbulent Leipzig aerosol cloud interaction simulator. Um, and you can see a schematic here on the right hand side. It is a wind tunnel, uh, this closed loop, or a Göttingen type, if you want to say so. And here uh, the flow goes in clockwise direction. Yes. Uh, and you can see here uh, a human model for scale. Um, the wind tunnel features two parameters, each with up to 5,000 liters per minute of airflow. 
And we can precisely define thermodynamic and flow conditions in both of these parameters. We have um, filters, humidifiers, um, flowers, um, thermostats, and heat exchangers for both of the branches. And then right after the measurement section here, these two branches meet again, and so we can mix two different um, conditions uh, airflows. Uh, inside the measurement section, you can set velocities of up to two meters per second, and we can vary the temperature and the dew point between minus 40 and plus 25 degrees centigrade. Uh, furthermore, we have a passive grid for the moment here, up, uh, some, some way above the, the merging of these two branches to introduce defined turbulence. And uh, thus, we can also inject the site selective particles between the branches, which can act as cloud condensation or cloud, for example. Um, open foam, uh, we are using it for uh, as a tool for experimental design and the interpretation of our experimental results. For example, um, if you do deliquescence and efflorescence experiments, we have uh, problems um, differentiating between bi particles and small um, unactivated droplets with our optical measurement systems. And here we can use the simulations to help interpreting these results. Um, if you want to, you can find some more information in the paper that you can see down here. Um, one numerical model, first for continuous phase modeling. Um, as a base, I use the CHD multi-region form driver. Um, additionally, I implemented the transport of humidity, of absolute humidity as passive scalar. Um, Furthermore, that crunch and particle tracking was also implemented in the fluid phase. I'll talk to, about this later on. Um, we are using LES simulations um, with uh, the dynamic equation model for the moment, and we basically employ all second order uh, for uh, second order schemes for everything. Of course, we only model a part of the wind tunnel, which part you can see here. It's uh, some way up above the merger of the branches. And only uh, only a portion of uh, of its width, and you can see the final mesh here on the right hand side. It is a hexaedral dominated mesh weighted with snappy hex mesh. It's approximately seven million cells, and we use many standard boundary conditions, except for um, this small reach here uh, between the two branches. There we have a solid region. Um, this is also the, the cause why we use this conjugate heat transfer so we have an energy bridge between these uh, two branches here, which might lead to some uh, phenomena. And for the uh, humidity, we have a mixed boundary condition, meaning that below uh, a relative humidity of 100%, we have a zero gradient condition there, and everything above 100% relative humidity is, in principle, so to say, condensed at the wall, so this, this water is lost then. Now I'll come to the dispersed phase modeling. Now we use a one layer crunch approach here, which is based on open in intermediate library. As forces, we use the track force with panning and correction, shear lift force, um, and gravity force. And I implemented the growth or mass transfer model, which accounts for trailer theory for couplet um, growth and its, its early stages, and for delicate sense and efflorescence effects as well. And the mass transfer is uh, basically driven by the gradient of the water vapor saturation between particle surface and the gas phase. Um, the subtime step for the Lagrangian tracking is um, uh, automatically adjusted so that the particle current number is below 0 0.5 and the mass uh, growth ratio is below 20% per uh, subtime step. And as already mentioned, we can inject these particles here where the two branches meet. Now I want to show two basic uh, experimental setups. One is the mixing of warm and cloud uh, and cold humid air without particles. Um, so we have uh, warm air at branch A and cold air at branch B <coughs> with different relative humidity and no aerosol here. Uh, the second case would be uh, the mixing of warm and cold nearly saturated air. So both branches are nearly saturated with respect to water at 97% relative humidity. 
Um, we, we used two different um, temperature differences here between the point of the 10 Kelvin and 16 Kelvin. And we also injected some particles here, uh, which are uh, sodium chloride particles with a toy diameter of 400 nanometers. Um, <clears throat> coming to the results for, for the um, temperature and humidity, you can see some exemplary state here at the right hand side. You can see the fluctuations where these two branches meet. Um, at the left branch, we have the warm air, at the right, right side, we have the cold air. And here at the right hand side, you can see the relative humidity. The warm air is uh, comparatively dry, and the cold air is relatively wet. And this makes us here as the flow evolves through the channel. And we have done some measurements for this. <coughs> and you can see some lines depicted here. They are 10 centimeters below the aerosol inlet. And here's a comparison of measurements and simulations of along these lines. The left hand side, you can see temperature in blue and dew point temperature in black. And the right hand side, uh, you can see relative humidity in red. And I would say these experimental and simulation results fit quite well. Um, then uh, to go further, we also wanted to check if we can um, reproduce the broadening of this mixing region. So we measured in three different regions. And you can see here the normalized temperature, how it evolves along this height uh, for 10, 30, and 30, 80 centimeters below the aerosol limit. And you can see that we can capture this, um, this broadening also quite well. And that we, what we are basically investigating is that um, uh, how these fluctuations influence the particle and droplet microphysics. Uh, okay, for next results are about the uh, this first phase, for the first time qualitative results. And uh, for remember, uh, just to refresh your memory, we have a mixing of form and cold, nearly saturated air with two different um, uh, temperature differences. At the left hand side, you can see results for 10 Kelvin, and right hand side for 16 Kelvin. And you can see at, at these planes uh, the relative humidity color coded. And the particles are injected here at the top. And then they are walked through the channel and they are color coded and sized according to their size. And as we would expect, we get a mixing zone here with uh, some super saturation as we have uh, two different. Um, temperatures here, which are both saturated, so we have a super saturation in the mixing zone, and the particles grow and shrink according to the uh, relative humidity they see. Uh, as one would expect, larger temperature differences lead to larger super saturation, and you can see it here at the bottom, also to larger diameters. Uh, what is not that visible here, but in the next slide, that it also leads to a broadening of the droplet size distribution. And what is quite interesting is that uh, a high temperature difference does not necessarily lead to um, uh, larger droplets, as you can see here. On the right hand side, we can start a um, temperature difference. We have here, for example, smaller particles. This is due to the um, uh, temperature or the energy bridge here in the, in the solid region I mentioned before, because we have at the warmer side, now we have a cold wall. Um, which leads to condens condensation of water at the wall, which is then lost for the flow. And so we have a smaller um, um, super saturation, which then in, in, in turn leads to smaller particles, at least at the top here, which uh, would have given us some headache if we only had to look at the, um, at the experimental results. But now with the simulations, we can explain what happens there. And we also have some. Um, quantitative results, here you can see the um, size distributions for the two different cases in, at a flux scale. And uh, left hand side again for 10 Kelvin and right hand side for 16 Kelvin temp uh, temperature difference, dashed lines of measurements and solid lines of simulations. Um, and you can see that uh, this also fits quite well, except maybe for this um, small peak here at a, at a small scale. And here you can also see again that the uh, um, size distribution is much broader with this larger temperature gradient. Okay, and this, this, uh, this size distribution hints at, at the influence of the turbulence as 
this large fluctuations on this um, size distribution. With this, I want to end. Here on the right hand side, you see a nice video from German TV show Nano by Dreiser. They've been at our lab and made some videos of the cloud in our simulation chamber. And the summary um, we established this is as a simulation chamber for turbulent cloud microphysics and have seen first sense of turbulence influences on the public world. And the coupled flow and particle simulation model in open form is a useful, adaptable tool for complementing our experimental work. And in the future, we want to uh, uh, continue our investigation of influences of turbulence on top of activation and also on freezing and vice versa. And of course, we want to continuously develop our uh, wind tunnel and our numerical model. Oh. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you for your very nice talk. So we have a couple of questions in the pile. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is by Josh Williams. He's saying, nice presentation. I see you use Cunningham correction in your track model. How influential is this? Have you run simulations with a versus without this correction? Um, I actually did not compare it, but as we have comparatively small particles, I um, thought it would be better to implement it. So we are, we are starting at a scale of 100 nanometers, so I think it would, uh, it's necessary. But I have not checked actually. Okay, thank you. Then uh, Lionel Gamay is asking, do you plan to add a model that can generate the particles without a, a priori injection, uh, injecting them? Um, no. Um, as um, usually, um, this does not really happen in, in the clouds we are investigating, as um, this doesn't happen at, at zero degrees Celsius, but at minus 38 degrees Celsius, so that, which is then called homogeneous um, nucleation, I think. Oh. oh, sorry, I'm mixing this up with um, ice nucleation. But usually, um, this does not happen without aerosols in, in, the, in the atmosphere. So we are not planning to do this. Okay. Um, Richard Kenny is saying, very impressive setup. What is the size distribution of the NACL seeding? I didn't quite catch that. Um, for this simulation, it was monodisperse. Um, but um, from newer simulations, we used this. Uh, uh, Gaussian distribution, but uh, um, the standard deviation is quite small, so it does not make that large a difference. One, one final question, maybe from my side. Did you also mm -hmm. looked in, into the, the library I resolved? Uh, I think from Philip Morris and, and collaborators, some university collaboration as well. And uh, what is it called? I resolved. Um, it's, uh, it has been presented some, some couple of years ago. You might want to have a look. Maybe there is some functionality you can just be, it can be just useful for you. Okay, for yeah, I'll, I'll have a look at that. Thanks for the hint. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. So by this, I actually want to thank all the speakers for this great presentation. So I do the clapping for you because the others can't. <laughs> And uh, yeah, by this, I'm closing the session and want to leave you with, uh, yeah, the, the idea that you can exchange further, obviously, on all the topics with the speakers in the meeting hub. Bye-bye.